Hi there, this is uh, going to be a review about the um, game Africa Orientale from Strategy and Tactics number 128 and um, just to sort of sum it up it's a bit of a disappointment and I don't think that's entirely down to me but um, it is to do with the way the game approaches um, its subject. Now essentially what this is, is it's um, it's built, at least I have seen it built, as a Europa series game, a mini Europa series game. But I don't think that's quite true. The trouble is, is, it, is it uses what's called the Europa series, which is a big grand old series of games, um, which was aiming to cover the whole of the war in Europa at the scale of, um, damn it, I don't have it to, to hand, but at a similar scale to this, this is actually half that scale. So this map would be big, uh, twice as large in the regular Europa scale. It's a grand operational system. It doesn't so concentrate on the strategic, the sort of grand strategic effects of the war, um, but on the operational maneuvers. Um, so the units modeled are brigades uh, and divisions um, and lower regiments and even groups. You, you, you're not, um, uh, having a counter representing a whole corps or army as a grand strategic game would. So you're looking in at the, sort of the, the, the grand manoeuvres of the armies as they fought over the terrain. And this, so it uses that system and then it depicts the um, war in uh, East Africa, essentially Ethiopia, Sudan, parts of Sudan and Kenya and what were called Som Somaliland at the time. Um, between uh, the Italian uh, forces and their colonial um, kind of allies and, um, and uh, the British uh, and uh, um, parts of its empire. So you have, um, essentially for the Axis side, you have two types of units. You have regular Indian units and colonial forces. So those will be um, raised uh, regiments and battalions of uh, Ethiopians um, commanded by Italians. And then on the British, you, you have regular British troops and then Indian troops and um, some others. I think they might be Canadian, something like that. So it, it's an ex for me, it's an exceedingly interesting situation. I've been interested in um, this portion of the war ever since I learned about um, the Italian invasion of Ethiopia, uh, Haile Selassie's um, flight to uh, eventually to a place called Bath, a town called Bath near where I was born in Bristol, and um, his um, um, his pleas to the League of Nations, of which his nation was a member, and the Italian nation and the British exception nation were members, which were ignored. Um, by the League of Nations. Uh, essentially, Italy was trying to get its bit piece of place in the sun on the African continent uh, uh, under cover of um, what else was going on in Europe. They grabbed um, Ethiopia and some surrounding areas and then um, it took a while for the Brits to c come back and throw them out. Um, with Yes, and there are they, 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 do, they do include, I think, some... African allies, um, yes, South African at least. So uh, anyway, for me, a very interesting situation historically, and I was really, um, uh, being, uh, I, uh, uh, wanting to sort of get into the Europa system more, um, because the little that I have sort of got into it, I re I really honed in on this game and uh, was looking forward to getting it. It was gifted to me by a, a very generous fellow. Who, uh, um, uh, to cut a long story short, short he saw I had it on my wants list, and uh, so I was really happy to uh, excited to come and play it. And what I find is that I, unfortunately I do not feel that the Europa system um, was the right fit for this game. Now, the, you do have this area of the world represented in a Europa game, I, perhaps, I guess a game that was released after this one, it's called 
uh, Wavell's War. So you will get this area on a, twice its size on the map and these same forces represented in the Europa system now. But at the time, I think essentially what happened was that the, the designer was looking to model this conflict, found the Europa system, that he enjoyed the Europa system, and he felt that he could make it and this conflict fit. Um, and the main expediency was just to um, reduce the scale. So uh, in Europa, every turn is three or four days. Uh, no, a week, I think. I, I could be getting some of the details wrong, but essentially he, he, he you know, he sort of doubled it or 50 percent of it, whichever way you want to look at it. So here, each turn is two weeks. Europa, it would have been about a week. Each hex is yay big. And in Europa, it would have been twice as big. Now, the trouble is, is that he's kept everything else consistent with the Europa system. So what, essentially what you have is you have units with the movement rate of six, but the smallest movement cost is two, because a clear hex in Europa would be one. Here, because it's twice as big, it's two. And then it's the same for like the roads. They cost two and so forth. And so already what you have to do is you have to do some maths. So you look at your country and say, okay, it has six movement rate. So I have to halve that. That's the first thing you have to do on the roads. And then it's all um, proportional for the others. So you have four in rough terrain and six in wooded rough and, and everything on the mountains. So the movement's already half as slow as it would be in a Europa game. Now, he could have just made a whole new game based on the Europa system, but instead started with his scale. So uh, a basic infantry unit would have movement rate of three, and it would move three clear hexes or three road hexes. So you wouldn't already have to be halving things. And then the same thing happens, but for a different reason, in the combat system, because in this situation, um, and in the Europa system, anything that is not, and the, as I understand it, and I've played, only played uh, first to fight, which is uh, the Blitzkrieg invasion of Poland. And in that, um, supported and armour um, effect, um, AE armour effects, combats and so forth, very important because there was a lot of armour in there and um, a lot of units supported or, or not supported by artillery and heavy weapons. In here, the, none of the Italians have um, heavy weapons support, except I think there's one unit uh, which starts in Addis Ababa, their, their strongest unit. And, oh no, there's two. So there's one uh, uh, artillery which can give support to other units, and there's one unit that has its own support. And the Italians... Um, um, move around a bit you can see it's all a bit sparsely populated at the moment so um, the the allies have been moving in here from uh, Mombasa and Addis Ababa the capital of Ethiopia is here and the allies have also been moving in from Port Sudan and they had a supply base in Khartoum and so they've been moving this direction and then in this direction so sort of essentially from those two corners and they've got border guards essentially here, which are just sort of moving in. But these are units that can't actually fight. They only have defensive strength. So they're putting the squeeze on the Italians who are um, in these the highlands, the Ethiopian highlands. Uh, Addis Ababa is the capital, which is the main um, objective. So and then the um, these are Italian colonial troops and these are Italian regulars. And so you can see there's not so many left. There was that, that many approximately have been uh, killed, as it were, in combat. And these have just left the board due to um, last turn's uh, colonial collapse, essentially because the um, Allies have captured enough uh, cities, um, Axis-controlled cities, um, in uh, Ethiopia, they... Uh, uh, the colonial forces have collapsed and most of them have left and gone back, gone home, left the fighting. So, um, anyway, so there was a lot of Italian forces here originally, lots and lots, and not so many um, allied, uh, essentially, British Empire forces. Um, 
But because none of them are supported, that means immediately they're all half combat value. So, like I said, there's two. Oh no, there's another artillery. So that would be three. And there's a, these. Are, uh, there's three t tanks. Um, so I make that three, four, five, six out of something like fifty units are combat supported. All the rest, whatever their their combat value is, and most of them you can see here is one. These are um. Uh, engineer forces for building forts and so forth. It's most of, practically all of them are one, so already that's half strength, N no question. Unless um, a, a supported supporting unit like one of the two artillery units or a, um, a tank unit is going to come with them, so it would have been much easier just to say that is the combat strength, and it, it, you know, and then doubled it of all the supported units. And so the British um, forces and Allied forces would be essentially doubled, and these would be left as they were. So um, that's another bit of maths you're having to do instantly before anything. And then the other things are that most that, that Axis have a lot of trouble with supplies, and so generally they're not supplied, which halves them again. So often you have like a quarter, and then you're having to work out a quarter against two or eight. And you know it's not difficult, but it's just an extra kind of load which is isn't necessary the only reason it's necessary is because he just took the europa system s pretty much straight and squeezed this into it instead of taking the spirit of the europa system and fitting it into his scale and um and that and that's not just it so that's sort, sort of uh, indicative of what's frustrated me about this game and it, I, I am disappointed in it because I'm really interested in the situation and perhaps it's my fault you know having too high hopes but um, I don't think it's just um, just me but I think it is this squeezing into the system then the, the other thing I'll just sort of get the grumbles out of the way before I maybe speak a little bit more about what I do like and what is good about it is essentially the opacity of it so um, I'll show you here that the scoring is very complex. Um, so you have here, during each six months period, you have to record this. Upon each occurrence, now, these things are never going to happen. The act, this, this is for the Axis player. He's never going to capture these unless the Allied player's done something seriously wrong. Because essentially, um, without his supplies, he, he can't get over them. He, he doesn't have sea transport like the Allied player does, so he can't do a surprise attack. And the Allies are attacking down the routes which would have to be got through to get to these. So those just really aren't going to happen anyway. So, But, you know, it's just one more thing you have to kind of think about that isn't really relevant. It might have been relevant in a kind of europa tile thing, but not here. And then per turn after, and then... Um, Okay, these are okay, but again here, so you have to sort of check per turn, and this isn't actually explained in the rules, um, I have to figure it out. And again here, per RE and the enemy replacement pool, so the replacement pool is this, it's fast for the axis, but then I made the mistake of as soon as the colonials went, because this was essentially the dead pool, I put the colonials in there. And then I suddenly realised, hang on, I don't think they're supposed to count for the rich conditions because they haven't been eliminated. Um, and if you're eliminated, you, that's a regimental equivalent in the replacement pool. Um, uh, and it doesn't spell out the rules, but so I assume they're separated there. So I had to quickly kind of figure out the separation. And I, I've, I've reached this point in the game. We start in December of 40. Um, so we have December and then we move into 41. Essentially, all the rest of the game is 41. And so I'm almost halfway through and the colonial crops has happened and I even made some mistakes that made it easier for the Axis at first, um, like forgetting to halve for supporting um, and so forth. But um, yeah, so the, the victory conditions are quite complicated and um, so six months it, the first section is from December to January. That's not even six months. That's like two months. Then you have another six months, and then another six months. So essentially, there's three sections of the game in which you could score that. And it, one, it wasn't ma marked on the map. I mean, on the turn track. So you can see with my colouring in, and also there weren't any counters to mark when it happened. So either you'd have to write it down on paper or I wrote it down. Okay, so um, 
uh, for controlling a city in Kenya, they get plus five. So I've marked here when they stopped controlling it. I made up my own counters. And uh, also the garrison units never had counters. I've marked garrison units. And because of uh, this, where is it? Um, minus one per regimental equivalent missing from garrison per turn. Well, if that is essentially what they call garrison units, then you need to mark per turn when they're killed. So when they, they die, put them in the replacement pool, of course, because they could come out as replacements as far as I could tell, you know, from reading through the rules. But then I need to mark it on there some way. So um, it's a complicated. This is kind of complicated. That's not really a complaint there, but then they should have helped you with a means to record it or, or at least give some hints in the rule book to say, look, you're going to need to note down that date because it's going to be important at the end. Otherwise, it's the kind of game where it assumes you've read the rules and you understand all of the rules and um, you can remember all the little details, but we're not going to um, put them down anywhere and remind you of them at the point where you need them. So, for example, in the um, uh, victory, um, victory conditions section. So this is the rules. I've um, blue tacked together these pages because they contain the charts and tables which I photocopied and put out here. It has it has a page here to tell you how to combine it with War in the Desert, which was the uh, Western African, North African, Western North African um, or Europa game at that time. But so you can see that's the rules. There's there's a, there's a lot of text in, and then here's all the setup and the reinforcements. Um, there's a, a lot in them, and that's okay. But then, you need when there's sort of important little bits and bobs scattered throughout. You need to record them. The other thing, which is a biggie, is the blue which I've coloured in. Is that is um, uh, where you can get bad weather, and I put the weather table on here because otherwise it's not even on these three sheets. It's in a, another place, um, and you know you need it to hand in those turns because if you get rain, then there's half movement and trouble with supply and so forth. Um, so yeah, the other th that's the part, the complicated scoring and the, the lack of help in, in telling you how to do it um, has made the game frustrating that you, it's not immediately obvious, it's kind of obviously what you want to do. The Axis want to keep you out of Ethiopia and the Allies want to get in there and capture the cities as quickly as possible. But it's not kind of obvious how soon and how quick it's going to happen. Essentially, the Allies have won at this point. There's no way the Axis are going to be able to beat them. So um, I would have to sort of work out how to do the whole thing again later. And because of that kind of opacity, the setup is fixed. But and the Axis have a lot of trouble in moving because they um they don't have the same supply system as the Allies. Essentially, their only supply is from um, supply counters and in the first one or two, uh, two two or four weeks the first maybe two turns they might not be moving any because until the allies actually launch an attack into um, their territory uh, they don't essentially get to move much they, they might move but unsupplied and that's at half movement rate and so you can understand if you've got six half your movement rate is three and it costs two on a road um, you're moving one hex and make, okay, then you've got um, strategic transit or whatever it's called, you know, so you can move double, so then that's two. Um, but again, you know, that stuff wasn't summarised. I had to summarise it all where it's needed next to the term, the, the movement rate, so that I know different rates of movement and different things that affect movement, blah, blah. But that's, you know, come with lots of games. But with this, particularly, say, with the, the opacity of the scoring, the complicated fashion of it, and, and no um, sort of... It's all there implicitly, but there's nothing implicit to tell you this is the way it's going to go, and this is... like You need to mark these points and these points, um, or something like that. Then what you, you need to know is essentially the Axis really needed to defend up front. They needed to defend some cities heavily and make it perhaps so that the um, Allies... Uh, don't have enough su supply to take the attacks rather than kind of defend go in, in I, I i set them up with a 
like a moving defence, you know, fallback defence, which let the cities get taken, not fast, and it was cost, been costing the Allies lots of supply. And all this supply has been used. Um, but it, it's cost them the game at this early point. So, you know, there was a huge flaw in the, how I played the Axis and that. I, I would have appreciated some explicit explanation of of how it's going to go rather than have to just gather it all implicitly and that's very common with games of this area at uh, era at least in that there's a lot of stuff which is implicit in the rules but it's never made explicit and i think at the time and maybe in, in that age I, I would have had fun exploring that so i'd have played it one time you know made tons of terrible mistakes then played it again and uh we or just I, whoever was playing, would have it a bit get a, better the second time, would learn a bit more the third, fourth time. But it's just, you know, we're, we're not like that now. We don't have, like, a month, one game a month, sort of at hand, or, or every two months or something. It, this game is not going to be played over and over, so um, the sort of opacity of it has, and you know, difficulty with it, the scale and having to do the maths, halving and quartering before you that factored in anything, just because, um, has been frustrating. Then, the yeah, the, again the opacity and the lack of aids. So, um, I even had a quick scratch one here. There's all the things you have SMPs, which is the supply movement points. So supply has a number of movement points and it's split between areas, and. Um, rail, the, um, rail capacity comes in and that's split and uh, then rail capacity is affected by rail depots but in effect rail capacity is kind of minimal for the axis because they have one rail line here and um, for the allies it only comes in um, in certain regions so again what you have because you're using your, your rope system you have quite a complicated and um, because of the scale quite a complicated Thing to figure out and then you have to translate it all according to the situation but because in this um, particular situation it's not doesn't have such a big effect on the game you have quite a lot of figuring out to do for very little effect and it's also the same with the air forces involved because um, the Italians have three air counters and the Allies uh, six air counters sorry and the Allies about a similar but the Italian air on a, every time they perform a mission on a one or two, they are rendered inoperative. And if um, to become operative again, you need to roll a one on a one d six. Now, I sent my Italians out on an air mission fairly early on. One of them became inoperative, and that's it. I've been rolling for it to come back into play since then. And the others I haven't sent out because a third of the time they're going to be inoperative. And I'm waiting. I was waiting for when I would really need them because they're obviously very fragile and exceedingly precious resource in that sense they can sway the battle quite heavily um especially with these really underpowered axis units but so you don't want to fritter them away so again there's um in here there's and it's europa style you know i recognize it from narvik and first to fight that i played you have about um one two um three uh, three and a half, say, pages of rules for the air combat, and it's it's not going to factor in that much. It, and the way it would factor in is, you know, because you, you hardly have any air-to-air -air combat because it's going to be too de deadly for the Axis. It's going to happen once or twice, and then they're either going to be wiped out pretty much ineffective. So they're gonna, the Axis is going to husband it for one crucial point, and the rest of the time it's just um, uh, factors in combat for the allies and so the allies they tend not to be fighting at much below eight to one odds because of the halving and halving of a one so you're getting a, 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 you're attacking against either a half or a, a quarter and at least you know, most of the time the allies can supply themselves for various reasons another reason why the supply is different for the allies as it is for the axis and again so with the air air warfare, it, there's a lot of overhead in kind of terms of fiddliness and, and, and having to remember things and and for actually very little um, meaningful effect in this game. Um, it would it would have been much better to sort of abstract it out and just say, okay, the allies, you know, yeah, this eight, eight 
they can well maybe if the allies had their air, air counters yes but the axis don't bother just give them some a couple of modifiers a couple of times or simplify the whole thing somehow um it just it just creates it gives you the impression that you're doing that you've got something extra to play with but it just gives you but the effect is you just get a lot of bother for not actually any uh, m much interesting decision making because it's you know if you want to bomb a port you're going to have to use all the air so you won't be using them that bit for have any effect in the system um, so you won't be using them to for ground support. So just you know, make it abstract. Like you, either this turn you could bomb a port, and this is the chance of effect. But the next turn you, you're on ground support, and you could divide it into this many battles for this much effect. Something like that. And then it's job done. Um, what else? Yeah. And so that's it. This, and it's it's mainly so, the annoying fiddliness of the scale and the maths that that involves in movement and combat so the two you know biggest things and then um and not just one form of movement but also the 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 supply movement points are do use a different movement rate and system than the um the regular um movement points so you know again you have to they have different movement points costs and again it's it's between two and like 18 instead of like one or six uh, um so and then then so yeah there's that all, all that that the sort of wrong scale and the fitness that incurs and then the um the opacity of implication rather than explication so in the the way the scoring system works and um, what other examples can I give? Uh, yeah, I, I gave it essentially like with the colonial collapse, the effect that that's going to have on the game and so forth. So, the effect of the tactics from the beginning. So, um so that's sort of all the bad, but the good is, is essentially it is a very interesting situation and the system itself is a solid system. But I've just, so, you know, those two things side by side are the pluses and they what, are what drew me to the game. But in this case, when they're married together, for me, it just doesn't really work. Um, I wish I had more good to say about it because I, I dearly want to... To, f to sort of um, find the positive in it. Um, I guess if, say, you were playing two players and you both had a copy of the rules and you would had lots of play, you would spent a lot of time, you know, I did spend a lot of time sorting out the player aids and so forth, and you had two minds that could help you to remember specific points of the rules that um, are important that you that aren't explicitly sort of summarised anywhere, then this could be quite an interesting... And you, you, each of your minds would have more time to think about the strategy, to work through the implications of the um, the victory awards and what that means for the, the campaign. And so the Allied Axis have to think about, they're going to have to defend quite far forward or else my colonials are going to collapse. Um, so throw your colonials forward... Uh, bring your nationals inward uh, for when that collapse has happened and and play it like that. I mean, even just that kind of explicitly stated in the rules would have made this a lot more enjoyable game because as it is, it's been... Um, and then the allies, you, you have you have to decide... You have sort of one, two, three, four main axes of attacks. Well, only three, really, because there's a road coming in no, a road coming in here, a road coming in here, and then a road wiggling in here through the mountains here. And um, you're going hit, to be hitting the main part of the mountains as the rainy season comes in, which is um, going to be very effective um, uh, for the defender. So it, that could have been enjoyable to sort of tackle that situation. But 
not if you have to wade through one game and sort of scratching and I mean an R in and then feel like, oh this is what it's all about. Right, okay, we'll stop now, reset and start again. Again, with another player you might have the stamina and the encouragement to sort of give each other other the the sense to do that. But for me it's um I I I've got this far and it could be reaching a really interesting point and I I'm just not interested anymore. Um, and I feel like the, the, you know, the Italians are not in a good enough situation really to make it that interesting. Um, the, the Allies are going to slog through the mountains in the rainy weather and then eventually they will hit Addis Ababa. It's just a matter of time. Can they do it within the time they have left? Um, and the Axis might have a decent chance of s stopping them. But it, I, they have set up some roadblocks and they might be too brittle and collapse um, too quickly or they might not be strong enough and the Allies get into the middle too quickly for you know climactic ul ultimate battle. Or it might <clears throat> be just right and they hold them off long enough for the kind of like <clears throat> moral victory, even though the, the Allies would have reached Addis Ababa and cleared them out at some point. Um, yeah, so I, it's kind of like the sense I have is it at the time it was an excellent effort, I think, but it would have been a valiant effort, I should say, but I, it was a bad decision to fit it into Europa. Instead, they should have taken the spirit of Europa and put it into their own scale and abstracted out um, things that, that, that worked out much better in abstraction. Um, and that I think is it really that's all I have to say about Africa Orientale I'd like to think that you know one day I'll, I'll come back and give it another go and uh, to that end I'm going to put some notes into the game you know to, to remind me how to play the axis the implications of um, the fall and when, uh, the colonial collapse and when that's likely to happen the important effect that has on the the beginning of the game and how the Axis perform their fighting withdrawal. So with that all said, that's over and out for Africa Orientale.